Creatives with AI Podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Peter, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much, David, for having me. I'm super excited to be with you today. Awesome. Um, so how did you get here? Like, how did you get where you are today? And, you know, what was that? What did that journey look like? And I think that'll give everybody a little bit of background of, of sort of where you're coming from. Oh, sure. Well, you know, I am the CEO and founder of a company called um, SwiftPress Support, and we build uh, websites and apps uh, for small businesses, uh, mostly here in the United States and also internationally. And it all started actually uh, quite some time ago, um, probably actually back when I first uh, got married. Uh, I was at the time I was working for a church and, uh, you know, it's a nonprofit and, you know, everything was uh, fine and dandy. Uh, but until we had uh, our first child and our second child and things began to ramp up and began to really get expensive. And now all of a sudden the, you know, uh, the money that I was making from uh, the church that I was working for wasn't really enough to pay for my wife, my kids, you know, and for all the extra expenses. I feel you. So. <laughs> yeah, so I decided, hey, you know what? I need to have like a side hustle to make some some extra money while I keep my full time job, and so uh, you know I started waking up early, like at four o'clock in the morning, and started to to go and create like this, uh, you know, some kind of uh, side hustle. And at the time, there was something called a PLR pro products, and th these were these kind of like products where you can create like little. Um, like small courses um, about any kind of niche that you want. And at the time, you know, I'm really good in like productivity and time management. And that's something that a lot of people struggle with when it comes to like procrastination. So I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and create this online business where I sell these little courses online. Um, and so every day I would wake up and I was just hoping that I would make maybe, you know, an extra $2,000, $3,000 every month just to be able to, to pay for the extra expenses. And so I went ahead and I was waking up every morning doing all the stuff and hoping just to make that amount of money. Finally, I launched it after putting in so many hundreds of hours of work. And uh, to my surprise, uh, instead of making the 2000 or $3,000 that I was hoping to make every month, I made a whopping $17.95. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, like, I figured something like that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like this is such an epic failure. I'm like, what happened? So I ended up hiring a coach and I told the coach like, Hey, here's a situation. Can you please analyze like what happened? And then he looked at like all the stuff that I, and, and that I did. And he said, aha, uh -huh, I found it. Your problem is that your pricing was so low is that you really hurt your credibility. Like no one's going to believe, you know, that you are this expert guru selling things for, you know, 1795 yeah, online. Yeah. yeah. So, He's like, you need to go the opposite and go high end and high, yeah. do executive coaching to CEOs and, and, you know, and do the time management for them. Uh, so I said, okay. So I went online and I found a course um, that would teach you how to do, you know, build courses for executives and charge a lot of money. And that cost me $10,000 just to learn that. So I invested $10,000 in the course. There's your lesson. <laughs> 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 that's the lesson yeah. right there yep, <laughs> they should have just gone this is it <laughs> yeah uh but wait so see if you can predict what happened to me david so i went ahead and i, and I did the course i followed everything there was all these other people in other niches doing the, the same class with me at the same time you know there after that you go out there and you do facebook ads to bring in your target clients everybody's you know getting one sale two sales three sales, whatever it is, you know, and they're making money after this money, you know, like no tomorrow, because they're charging like, you know, $5,000, $10,000. Um, so I go ahead and I, and I launch it and I do everything that everybody else is doing. And it's just crickets, you know, <laughs> I do absolutely no sales. And so that was another failure two in a row. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm I'm now in debt, you know, from the, my first business that failed, the second yeah, business that I paid ten thousand yeah. dollars for the course. So I'm further into debt. Meanwhile, I'm even more into debt because of, you know, my expenses with my children, and I'm just going deeper and deeper into debt. And I'm just like, man, what what am I supposed to do? And you know, I had uh, I had the skill of building websites, and I had uh, one of my friends who owns a marketing agency, quite successful actually. And he says, hey, he, one time he gets uh, gets a hold of me and says, hey, Peter. You know, I know that you're good at building websites. Would you be interested in doing white labeling uh, with my agency? 
And I'm like, white labeling, what's that? And he's like, white labeling is basically where I hire you as a contractor, but you act as if you're one of my team members or my staff and you build websites for all of my clients for my agency. And I said, sure, no problem. At this point, I'll do anything. Um, and that's how I got started. I started building websites for him and his clients were super happy. And I kept on doing that for several years and he was paying me and he was making money. And I also branched out on my own and um, it was very successful. And I was able to get out of debt and, and pay, you know, get pay my way out. So that is kind of the backstory of how I started my business. We started branching out after that because of apps, uh, small business owners we need to have apps as well. And then we also do advertising for them after we build those websites and apps for them. Now they need traffic, they need to get sales. So we do advertising. So it's kind of a one-stop solution for all of uh, small business owners needs when it comes to uh, advertising websites and apps. And so were you doing that as a, were you sort of moonlighting and doing that as a second job? Was that the idea that you would do your day job and then you would do this on the side? Or were you trying to to have that in the very beginning? Did you just want to spin that up and that two grand a month? Did you want that to be your your full income? Yeah, no, that's a great question, David. For me, I really enjoyed working for the church. You know, it gave me a, a big sense of meaning and purpose. So I always, the idea was to always just have my um, my full-time job at the church and then to have a side hustle and just to continue doing that. But what ended up happening is that my side hustle grew to a full-time job and it became popular as I got more and more clients. And so what I ended up doing is that to this day, and I've been in business for nine years now, coming up on my 10th year anniversary quite soon, um, is that I, I still work for the church and I have my full-time business. I just hired more, um, you know, uh, staff in, nice. in the business to keep, to keep it on. So I have both, both going on. Both going on. Yeah. I had a, I had a similar background actually, so I can empathize with you because I back, you know, this was 30 odd years ago when my, my kids were born, but, um, but I had twins and I worked in the travel industry and the travel industry doesn't pay very much either. It was great fun and it was, you know, it was a good job, but it wasn't making enough, you know, I wasn't making enough to make ends meet. And so I started this, this, um, nighttime job doing data conversion for a startup in Chicago. And very quickly, the same thing sort of happened as it's, you know, that job became my full-time job. They're like, oh, we got this big contract. We need you to come on. You're really good at working with people. Cause they were just a bunch of software engineers. They did, you know, they didn't have any kind of customer experience on a commercial level and, and that sort of thing. So they were like, you know, can you just come on and, and, and help us with that? And that was my transition into, I mean, that was the mid nineties and that was my transition into tech. And, uh, so very similar situation. So, okay, cool. I like it. So how, how are you using AI and in, in your, in your day to day life then? Yeah, we were using it on on so many fronts, David, and and I love that you that you were able to make the transition to tech because look at where it led you today. So definitely exactly. the best thing. And, yeah, and look at what happened to the travel agency <laughs> world, also. You know, I I tell you what, I got out just at the right time, yeah. um, because that was still before you could really book your own travel online, and it wasn't too many years after that that really you know the big booking sites came on, and then all the airlines started going on, and it absolutely decimated the travel industry from you know that agency model because you know i was working on at some jobs i was working for like american express travel and there were like 300 agents on a big floor and you know we were all just taking calls because that's the only way you could book it you know nobody booked their own flight you couldn't you know yeah. and um, yeah. so accidentally i got really lucky <laughs> and kind of switched industries you know just two or three years before I think there was a big shift. So yeah, you're absolutely right. But I just got lucky. There was no foresight in it whatsoever. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm, I'm so glad that you did. And I'm glad that we got a chance to connect with you today. Um, and then, you know, as far as AI, and I love the podcast, you know, because you're talking about a very important subject, AI. And man, AI has revolutionized, you know, my industry. So definitely for, for me as a web design agency, we use AI in, uh, in, our, in our agency. Uh, definitely the, the number one way that we've used it and that has helped us out so much is in copywriting. So taking the text for, you know, creating the text for the homepage, for the about page, services pages, contact pages, those used to take hours and hours. And now it takes just a few minutes. You know, we've engineered, you know, uh, an amazing prompt that we know what's the best layout for a homepage. So all we have to do is put in information about the business and talk about their services. And we put it in our perfect prompt and out comes the text. 
And then the next part, go ahead. That's really, sorry, I'm just jumping in. That's really interesting. And how long, I'm curious to know, and I don't, you don't need to give away any trade secrets. You don't need to tell me what the prompt is and how it works. But I've heard this from a lot of people and I've heard some super, super clever ways that maybe we can talk about it offline just to, so you don't have to tell everybody. But because that's where the real IP is starting to come in is my point is it's how you how you learn to prompt the system to get out of it something that's useful and good. And my question is, how long did it take you to to work through and to really come up with a prompt that you could that you were comfortable with that you could use over and over? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing is, is that the problem with AI right now is that if you just go into AI, you know, using any of the AI models and you just tell them, hey, give me the homepage for, um, you know, a bakery or, or something like that. And it just gives you like, hey, here's yeah. a different section. You're not going to get good results. No. Um, yeah, the, the text is bad. The layout is bad. The order of everything is bad. So it just will not get you good results. And and that's the problem with people just going out there and DIYing business owners, DIYing doing their own website is that you, if you just use, you know, AI tools, you're not going to get good results. So for me, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the model that I really found really resonated and brought fantastic results is a model with, I forgot the name of it, but, um, I, it'll come to me in just a second, but basically what, what we like is we, we, if you're familiar with like direct response copywriting, you know, and using those kind of methods to, in order to elicit a response from the people, because really, you know, a lot of people focus on branding, but we want to focus on, hey, eliciting, you know, uh, people to come to your website and to get them to either capture leads so that you get leads to your to your business or that you actually make the sale. Um, so in that in that sense, there's definitely a certain format uh, that you can you can follow in order to do that. So, you know, we we like to do like definitely at the very top. And I, I don't mind talking about the formula. Uh, at the very beginning, at the very top of the, of the hero section, which is the header section, it's very important that you pass the five second rule. And the five second rule is basically a rule that says that if somebody new comes to your website and they cannot tell within five seconds, I think people think five seconds is too much. It's actually three seconds. If somebody cannot tell, come, to, come to your website and tell exactly what you do, they're leaving immediately. Yeah. And. And that's like basically, you know, putting, uh, you know, flushing money down the toilet because it's so it annoying is, as well. Right. <laughs> <It's so laughs> Absolutely. Annoying. And once so, you once you key into that, because, again, I've worked in digital marketing and, and doing web analytics and, and analytics of this stuff for decades. And um, I it just I sometimes I go on websites and it's just got this airy fairy stuff. And it's like you have no it could be any sort of business. You have no idea what they do. Um, so I'm, I'm hundred percent with you on that. You know, it's, it's also that bottom line up front kind of thing, right? It's like, tell me, tell me what you want, tell me what you do, whatever. And then let's get on with it. Cause then, yeah. So, and I'm, I'm doing a website refresh with someone right now. And that's something that we're working on really carefully is to, to pass that test, to make sure that people know this is, this is what we do. And then you can do all the fluffy stuff later. That's it. That's it. So that that's what we do. So we always say in the hero section, the header section, always talk about, hey, what do you do? And kind of include what's the benefit, one benefit of, of what you do. Yeah. And then after that, um, put in, you know, uh, the text. And then after that, the next thing that we like to do that most people don't do is that we talked about the problem or or we, we like to say, like, you know, because the thing is, is that you want to empathize and show that you understand your prospective clients, you know, uh, problem. So we like to say, hey, here's the problem that you're experiencing and here's the solution. So we do um, hero section and problem yeah. solution yeah. and then um, benefits, you know, services um, and then how it works section, you know, show that you, it's very easy to do business with you. I like to do it within three steps, maximum four. Um, and then after that, another maybe call to action with the benefits. And now you have a beautiful layout for a homepage that brings you results. Yeah. And so I'm curious because I, I mean, obviously I have a show and I talk about AI incessantly um, and I use it all the time in my own stuff. I'm curious to know what your, what do you think about like the success rate? I mean, like you said, you've probably tweaked now your prompts to get more accurate, better results. But I also find that a lot of times, even if you say, you know, brainstorm, if you give it text and say, give me 10 ideas about titles for this piece of content or whatever, it just never, I, I can just never get it to do it kind of the way I want. 
but sometimes I wonder if there if the AI is maybe better <laughs> than mine. Um, I I don't know what how, you know. Have you tested that before? Have you ever tested that? You know, and done some A/B testing and say, well, this is what I would write, and here's what a here's what the AI recommended. Which one performs better? Have you have you ever done any of that kind of testing to see if how it works? I have, I have, and I have done that kind of testing, and I found that um so, more, so many times that what I've come up with because of my background in in copywriting what did perform better. Um, and honestly, I went in hoping that I would be wrong, that I would be able to have AI do better. But I think the problem was is that AI are LLMs, right? They're large language models. And with that, basically, you have all the data that is, you know, it's learned is both basically both good data and junk data. So you, you have to take that. So, you know, if you have something that would typically get like an A plus in copywriting, but you also have the things that are getting B, C's and D's and F's. And it's basically saying, hey, here's all of it. And here's the average. And here's what we think you should do. But the, here's here's some secrets, David, is that if you know, for example, that there's a good copywriter. And when I'm talking about copywriting, just for those who are listening, I'm not talking about like intellectual property or a copyright legal stuff. I'm talking about yep. the skill and the art of writing persuasive copy that convinces people to uh, take your call to action and to do business with you. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, and so there's basically very many skilled uh, advertisers that are that are out there, like um, and and uh, legendary copywriters. So if you know, for example, somebody that I like is I forgot his name, Gary Halbert. Yeah, Gary Halbert, one of the very famous copywriters, or um, somebody else like um, I forgot Clayton, something else. I forgot the, the names. But either way, the point is that if you know somebody, the thing is that you can go into your AI model that you're using, like that ChatGPT or anybody else, and say. Hey, you know, create this uh, piece of content for me. Give the prompt, and then write. Say, hey, write in the comp and the style of the so and so person, the famous copywriter. And then now, that because that you know the AI has been trained on that, it will spit it out, and it will sound very persuasive and sound very different. So you can also play around with that, and that's also been very exciting. And do you th do you think there are any copyright issues around that? Yeah, it it depends. And, you know, I, at the moment there haven't been any because those the people's works that it has been trained on have been public domain, right? So if it's in the public domain, basically it's like the same yeah. thing as like, hey, maybe you go out there and you write with your own hand, you know, uh, the, a person's persuasive letter to in an advertising in a magazine or something. Yeah. So at the moment there have been no um, legal cases that I know of against doing that. So, so far, so good. Uh, where I have seen, of course, intellectual property issues are like with actors and actresses and, you know, uh, stuff that's like behind paywalls and stuff like that. And who knows, it's still early in the game and who knows what other legal cases might be coming soon. But as of now, at the time of this recording, it, using, you know, yeah. the prompts in that kind of style, it's been clear and you're free to use it. Go ahead and try it out. Yeah, and I think just something for the listeners, because we'll have listeners in different countries as well. Aiden. Um but the laws the the laws are a little bit different in both countries as well. So, you know, the UK and the US vary in how they approach copyright and all that sort of stuff. So we'll give that disclaimer straight away. Um uh, sorry about that. Um it's been interesting to, to, I guess, two points on that. One is, is that from what I know as well, anything that's created by AI is not copyrightable yourself. So if you, if you use it, you can't claim copyright on it. Um, and it was interesting because the, was it the, was it Satya or whatever from Microsoft? I can't remember someone from Microsoft literally just the other day said, well, if it's open, you know, if it's on the web, then it's open source and anybody can use it. And it's, you know, it's free to use and no one's got copyright over it, which um, greatly annoyed many, many people. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we haven't seen a test case for that kind of thing yet. Um, and also, I think some of the people probably that you're modeling off of probably aren't alive anymore anyway. And so, you know, do, are there estates really going to go? And like, I don't know, it's super complicated. It's It's really complicated. So... I was just curious. Um, so, so how does that how do, how has that affected your your work? Like, what's the ROI you're getting from from all, like 
I guess maybe your first question is what tools are you using? So you're using it to do some copywriting and stuff. Do you use any other tools to do other things or is that mainly what you use it for? I do. I do use other tools to do other things too. So that's primarily one of the, the big things that we do is, is we know, we know we've crafted perfectly our amazing, you know, prompts to build websites and stuff like that. Uh, we also use it for UI for the apps that we build for our clients. So also we use AI to, to build, you know, the, the user interfaces, the user experience for the apps and we show it to our clients. They love it. And we're able to build, uh, build them that way. And the third way, which I think you might be using it also in, in this capacity, which is the, the marketing and advertising. So we use also AI and advertising and marketing when it comes to advertising, we like to use platforms um, that like can basically sit on top of like you know the the, the advertising platforms. So the, the two most, probably most famous and most popular advertising platforms are going to be Google Ads and Meta Meta Ads. Um, of course, there are other uh, other advertising platforms as well. Um, so like uh, LinkedIn, TikTok, um, advertising on um, Snapchat. So. We like to use third-party tools. One of the tools that I like to use is called uh, Play.io. It's spelled P-L-A-I.io. And what this does is that it's basically a software that sits on top of these advertising platforms. And instead of you going to Google and you going into, um, into Meta and you creating the ads and doing all these things, you can go in there and it's basically AI on top of your uh, of advertising platforms. And you're able to basically just give like a landing page um, to the AI and basically it'll scour it, understand it, it'll create headlines for you, many headlines, it'll create main descriptions, it'll put them next to each other, it'll provide videos from Shutterstock that you can use and it will remove the watermark. It will also add images if you Jeez. want. Yeah. It's, right. It does everything for you and then it creates all these different ad sets and it pins it next to each other and it also finds the, the targeting for you like recommends like, you know, Hey, who's this, who should you be targeting? And then you're off, you just create the ad and then you create multiple of these and you put them next to each other. And then on Google and on Facebook, they also have a layer of AI to help them find out, Hey, which are the best performing ads and then play the IO will automatically turn off your worst performing ads and put your best performing ads on and you just keep on rinse and repeat. And man, we get amazing results uh, yeah. for our clients um, using these tactics. Interesting. Uh, back in 2003, I worked for a behavioral targeting company that did something very similar, but they did it inside the content on a website. So as you interacted with the website more and more, we could target the content on the website based for whatever goal we were, we thought you would be most likely to convert. Um, and in plain English, <laughs> what that means is say, for example, if you went to book a, 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 an airline ticket, we could work out, were you likely to want a hotel? Were you likely to want a rental car? Were you traveling with family or like, was it a family trip or was it a business trip? And if it was a business trip, you know, you wanted different things than a family trip. So you'd want, we'd present different hotels, you know, on the list because we could tell, you know, some was leisure and some was business and those sorts of things that so we could do that within the website. That was 2003. Oh, um, wow. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's super interesting and in, in the way it can do it. The, so we're, so you use that, does it dynamically create the ad content then as well? It does We're using AI. You, you have, you have two choices. You can either use AI or you can come up with headlines yourself. And on this one, I know your next question is going to be like, have you, have you tried doing your own headlines? I haven't yet, but I will, um, soon, but it's just like the, the simplicity and how much it saves time and it got good, great results. And I love that it'll automatically, you know, turn off your worst performing ads and, you know, put more ad spend towards the best performing ones. And so you're just always trying to beat the control. And so for our listeners, the control is that one best performing ad that you always have. And so any agency that's worth its salt, its goal is to always beat the control, whichever is, is your best performing yeah. ad, yeah. your goal is to always you know, uh, do better than that one. And so that's why it's always good to have an agency in, in your, to help you out with that. So that so there's somebody that's always, uh, in, looking out for your best interest, always trying to, to get you more sales, more leads, whatever you're trying to do for the conversions. Um, top tip for anybody listening, all of that's really good, but it, 
in my experience, and, and maybe you'll correct me, so this is where the industry may have moved on a bit, but in my experience that it takes a lot of traffic for that to really work. If, you, if you've got a website and you have 10 visitors a week, no amount of targeting is really going to, do you know what I mean? If, if, you, if you're only getting 10 impressions or whatever a week, that's not enough to be able to do it. You need substantial traffic and you need substantial numbers to really be able for those algorithms to work correctly and to work best. Um, so I guess that kind of depends on your budget and how much you've got to spend and how many impressions you can get. And then for it to start to see what it's going to do. Is that right? Yes, I, I do agree with you, and I, th I think I think David, what, what matters is, is that it depends on the service that that you're offering, and and it depends on how it is that you're setting up everything, and what does your funnel look like, right? Yeah. So, for example, let me give you a case study from uh, from us. Um, you know, one of our ad advertising clients, um, she owns a school, and the school is basically for both typically developing kids and also for special needs kids. Okay. All right, and so we've set up um a landing page for her for special needs and we say hey you know what if you have a special needs kid you know here's our school it's called smart start and here's what we offer we help kids with autism we help kids with um you know all these different um, issues AD, adhd and so with that one you know basically we're able to target you know keywords on google and also on meta and to say hey here's a special needs school and if you're interested in getting more information or touring, just fill out this uh, this form. You can get some more information or schedule a tour. And that has been phenomenal. And, you know, with just like five, ten dollars a day, she's been able we've been able to get her like one to two leads, you know, sending her a message saying, hey, we're interested in coming and taking a tour. So in that sense, it's great, you know, but you take another client, for example, that is selling e-commerce health and wellness products. They're going to need, like you were saying, you know, um, thousands and thousands of impressions and traffic to be able to come and make the sale and then do the retargeting and do all that stuff. So just so many different services, so many different products and different ways to set up your funnel. So you're going to really need to create like, you know, the best campaigns that will uh, to yield the best results. And as you know, as an advertiser and as a marketer is that you always need to be testing everything Everything's yep. like, it's, yep. there's a science, you know, and it's yep. like, you have a hypothesis, you need to test it and find out, Hey, is your hypothesis correct or not? And then you need to take corrections. Yeah, that's right. And, um, I apologize for any people who are expecting a pure AI discussion. You're going to learn a lot about ad tech. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause ad, we've gone ad, ad a total AI. rabbit hole of ad tech and, uh, yes. but that's okay. That's okay. I don't, I don't mind. Um, so I'm also curious to know, so you've integrated AI into your workflow. And this is something a lot of people, at least in my experience, don't talk about. And I'm curious to know, so what sort of ROI are you getting from using those tools? Have you have you actually sat down and tried to work it out and said, well, before we were using AI, this was the situation. And now that we use it, you know, here's the boost that we've got from it. Is it a, have you done, I guess the question is, have you done the work and to, to kind of figure that out? And how did, how did you approach it and, and what sort of results did you see? Yeah, well, in terms of the advertising and AI using AI and advertising, you know, all, all the platforms that I have do have built in analytics in them. So they've already calculated for us. They can tell us the, the ROAS, which is the return on ad spend. And we just plug in, the, you know, the, the client's, um, you know, price points for their But services. I mean your business specifically. So your business says not, not for your clients. I mean, for you and your business. So, you know, if, if it used to take you, I don't know, two days to write the copy for a website, now it takes half an hour, right? You've saved a day and a half's worth of man days to, you know, and there's a cost with that. And I was just, I was curious across all the different things that you do in your own company. Have you looked at that to see how AI's had an impact on the business? Yeah. All I do know is that I've saved hundreds of hours, but to, to what extent? I don't know. It's just been phenomenal. But like because of the time savings, like you you said, like the copywriting would take days, you know, to come up with a homepage and, you know, come up with a text. And sometimes I even have to hire it out to, to somebody who's a copywriter and that was going to cost a few hundred dollars. And now I don't have to do that. Yeah. So that saved me like $300 maybe on a homepage or something that I typically might've done in the past to save time. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, so there's that, that kind of savings and then time management. Oh my gosh, hundreds and hundreds of hours, every single, I would say month, because I use it usually for a lot of different things. 
Um, I also use it for emails, like to create replies to my emails. Um, and with the tools that I use, like I can go into my email for my business and I'll have already crafted with AI three different responses to every single email that I get from my clients. And I just choose which one I want. Boom, done. I just did it. I just replied in 10 seconds and instead of, you know, five to 10 minutes for one for one reply. So you multiply that by, you know, uh, tens and tens of emails that I get every day. Oh, my gosh, the the productivity and the time management that I save. It's in the hundreds of hours. I'm positive. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think, I, again, it's not something that I hear a lot of people, you know, I go to a lot of events, so many events around AI, and nobody ever talks about the the, the case study, you know, and, and no, everybody goes, yeah, it's really cool. It saves me all this time. And it's like, okay, but what's the, what's the actual impact? You know, what, what's the, the ROI that's come from that? And it's interesting just, and this isn't a criticism. It's just, a, I find it interesting. No one's kind of sat down and gone, do you know what? Actually, yeah, my, my day rate is, you know, whatever it is, let's say, you know, 800 or 500 a day. And you say my day rate is 500 a day. You go, it used to take me two days to do that. So that's a grand. And now it takes me half an hour. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I've saved, yeah. you know, 750 pounds worth of my time that I could now bill out doing something else. And, you know, and that's had a huge impact on, on what I've been able to do. And, you know, you multiply that across again, you know, your emailing and your task lists and all the other stuff that you use it for and like image creation and just going and finding images. I mean, I've, I've done websites. It's one of the most time consuming things is going and, you know, you're trying to find original imagery and you're trying to come up with something that's, that's unique, that gets across the message that you want. And you can spend days doing that. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Um, so yeah, you know, there, there's a, there's a massive upside to that. And, um, yeah, I just, yeah. Anyway, I find it. Really no, it's, it's, it's a good point that you bring up, David. I think, I think it just depends on what you're going to do with that information, you mm -hmm. know, or, or why it's valuable to you. So, you know, if, if that, and if that data and, and creating that research and doing, finding out, you know, what is the ROI on AI and you need it, let's say, for example, maybe, you know, your uh, you need it for your your shareholders or you know your 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 board information to justify costs, you know, and all these different things. Then yes, you would need to do a study and you know come up with that information because that information is useful to you. For somebody like me who's a sole proprietor, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't. It doesn't take a genius to to figure out that you know, hey, this tool is amazing and it saves me like so much time. I'm like, boom, I'm good. I'm sold. I'm going to pay the twenty dollars a month, the thirty dollars a month. I love it. I'm going to use it. So uh, yeah, in that sense, yeah. um, but I can imagine for people that that do need the information that would be useful for presentation or to share with their with their company or with their employees, yes, doing a study would would be very quite valuable. Do Do you think it's and again, this this is going to sound like a pointed question, and it's totally not. But do you think, as your business has grown, would you have hired people to do some of that stuff, or, or, you know, ha has it meant that you didn't have to to work with contractors, like you said, you know, you don't have to go out to somebody to write the copy for you. So from that perspective, it's kind of saved you some money, and it means that you you're more efficient, and you don't have to do that. And I, before you answer, again, this is not a criticism and it sounds like a loaded question. It's not. I'd say all the time that the biggest irony of this show is that I have a show talking about how AI is going to take everybody's jobs and I use all the AI so I don't have to hire anyone. So I I totally get it. But I, I, I guess I'm just asking if that's also your experience and you're just like, well, actually, it means I don't have to hire that assistant or I don't have to hire that, you know, that person to, to then work for me. I can actually do all that myself. And that's, you know, that's saving me, you know, 30, 40 grand a year just in salary. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly, uh, there's, there's no way around it. You know, there's no, absolutely. I definitely have had so much savings costs because of that. And I'm so much more profitable. And also the, my clients win because I'm able to turn around their projects a lot faster. So for example, uh, you know, a homepage design that typically would have taken, you know, three or four weeks. Now I can do in, in a week, you know, or, or less and show them like, and, you know, in something where uh, in businesses where first mover advantage is very critical and it's very time sensitive, those are big wins for my clients. So yeah, there's no, there's no way around it. Absolutely. AI is a game changer. You save yeah. money, you save time, uh, you save a lot of different things. You get different ideas, 
you know, I, I, one of the things also that I, I like to to do, David, is to to basically put the AIs, you know, uh, put them against each other. So there's different tools that you could use, you know, and like, hey, give the prompt and send it to ChatGPT. Take the same prompt, give it to Google Gemini. Take the same prompt and send it to Claude. Yeah. Then take the next prompt and send it to somebody else, you know, whoever it is, Anthropic, whatever, so, uh, the different uh, so, Sonics, whatever. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I've not, I haven't used Llama. That's the only one that I've done, which is the, I think the, the, the meta one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm like I have I have so many AI tools. I'm like like uh, like literally I can get anything, and then I just go and compare. The only thing is is that I haven't found like a nice tool that can you know use all the different LLMs and like compare it like side by side. I want to see it like horizontally, like in in my browser. All of them will just give like you know hey you just will give it to you like in one long thread. So it's kind of difficult to read. But there's either a, there's way, a free startup know. idea for anybody listening. Yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I, I, I probably should, <laughs> should do it myself. 4%. 4%. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you know what's interesting about that though as well? Um, is I think if somebody did develop a tool like that, um, because that would use the um, API interfaces to the different platforms, it would also mean that anything that you query would not get put into their training model. Because at the minute, yeah. if you use it through the interface, if you go to ChatGPT's website or use their app, anything that you type in and all the results from that get fed into the training model for the, for the, bigger, for the bigger engine, whereas if you use the API, it does not. So that would be another way if you're a business trying to protect your IP mm. and had something like that where you could do a side by side, it would be using the API connections instead. So you would need to set it up and you'd need to give it, you know, your custom API key and all that. But once you did that, then yeah, you, that would be a really interesting tool. I like it. Yeah, I, I think, like I think that someone yeah, should Ron, do that and pay well, us. Well, <laughs> would, would you, would you buy such a tool? I probably would actually, I would certainly use it. Yeah, um, and, and I, I, I think it's a, a really thing. it's a really interesting idea because different tools are good at different things, and um, you know, like Pi. I don't know if you've if you've if you've talked to Pi at all, but Pi, uh, you know, Pi was trained on video and and audio content in the beginning, so it's it speaks like a human because that's what its core model was built on. Whereas ChatGPT's core model was built on you can tell it's like a lot of educational books and stuff because that was the stuff they had access to to train it in the beginning so it if you want a business sounding or an or a you know a, a higher education type language then it's very good at doing that you know claude's kind of somewhere in the middle and it claude's very good at emotions um i don't know if you've tried to use it but anything that you're asking it for an like to write an emotional story or an, an email where you need to get something across emotionally i find claude very very good at that um anyway that's all i'll buy the buy um yeah. sorry that's wonderful love it we're getting off track all over the place it's great um so my i guess my next question is and what's missing like what would you what ai tool would you like to have other i mean i guess we've answered it kind of as you want the side by side thing is there anything else that you think would be really cool that you'd really like to see where ai could pick up the slack for you yeah, absolutely. I th I think I'd like to, uh, for me, like as a person, like my personality is I, I like to be, I like to, to choose the best. I always want to make like the best decisions and have the best of everything. So it would be cool if there's like some kind of AI tool where you can like compare like different outputs or compare different results. And then that AI tool would analyze all of them and tell you, hey, for this use case and for this context, for what you're trying to achieve out of all of these options, this is the best one. Oh my gosh, I would pay money for that as well. <laughs> That's another <laughs> amazing idea because imagine then you have the best of everything. Um, so you would just give it the output. Hey, you can send the output and get all the different AIs. And then after that, you have one AI that governs all of them and choose the best one for the current context. Boom. I think that would also save a lot of time, but I just don't know how that would be, how you could execute it and what AI yeah. language, which AI model you would use to even, you know, take a look at all the different outputs and take a look at all the different things and have it choose the best one. So uh, I, I love that. I also like, um, you know, for things to uh, improving um, prompts, 
You know, I don't know if you've seen some of those, but th those are out also right now, but they could definitely um, use some improvement themselves. So about like, you know, how, how to improve, like you know, when you give a pro uh, the prompt itself and then you say, hey, improve this prompt and it would improve it for you. A lot of times it, it does get you better results. The best tip I got from someone around prompting was, was the, the phrase, make it punchy. Make it punchy. <laughs> and if you, if you just say, make it punchy, it takes a lot of the extra words out. So it will actually just, it will condense everything and make it a little bit more concise. And, and oddly, it makes it sound more human instead of less human. It takes like all the therefores out and all the like random words that again, you only see in educational text. <laughs> that no one ever writes in any marketing copy ever anywhere and it but it, it tends to remove all that stuff and it makes it sound more human so um i don't know if you've ever tried it but try it on a few you know ask it to give you a description of something and then say make it punchy and see what it comes back with and see if you don't like it better um yeah. that's a that's oh, a top tip oh. that someone taught me yeah i do i do want to try that one so i've never tried it make it punchy so i'm going to definitely try that immediately today after the podcast uh, and then the one that I do write, like I also learn from some of the tools that I use about creating brand voices and with brand voices, like, like you, you can like analyze any kind of brand. Let's say you want a brand like Nike or whatever, you give them the copy and then the brand, the AI will tell you, oh, this brand voice is educational and sympathetic and empathetic and conversational. So then you would basically write in, in any piece of copy, say, hey, write this piece of copy in a sympathetic, empathetic, and conversational tone, and then boom, you've just changed you know, the, the output. You want something else, you wanna write it in a professional tone, you're gonna get the therefores and uh, you know, the, all the professionals. And it's interesting, David, also that we talk about the internet, the, you know, the therefores and the educational content, because also with me working with different cultures, I find that there's some cultures that are more formal and some that are that are more informal. So you being based out of London, you know, I would say definitely England is tends to be uh, a little bit more, a little bit more skewed towards formal, they're going to be polite, they're going to be, you know, kind. Um, and but also they're, they're they do like to to to, to be to, the, to get to the point. Um, as in America, people here are very informal and they're very direct, you know, so they're going to be informal cultures like India, for example, we're talking about Satya Nadella earlier and Microsoft, they're going to be more on the formal side. Um, you know, so it just depends also. So sometimes yeah. you're thinking like, Hey, in, in your country, wherever you're at, like, I don't need this, but in other countries, they actually are, do want to have that more formal, um, you know, uh, tones and stuff. So that's also something to keep in mind. The context of where you're writing to and from is going to be very important. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. So if you had to take out your crystal ball and where do you see, how do you see things evolving over sort of the next, I don't know, three to five, because any further than that's ridiculous to even talk about. I mean, five years is ridiculous to talk about to begin with, but we'll limit it there. Where, where do you see this all heading? Like, where do you think we're going to be five years from now? Yeah, I definitely see there's going to be lots of jobs that are going to be lost. Um, and so it's very important for people to be nimble and to see the writing on the wall. So if you are in an industry and you are going to have a job that is going to be overtaken by AI, you know, it's best to start getting education and training on something else and seek a new career, seek a new business, a new side hustle, whatever it is. Uh, because AI is is estimated that it's going to replace like 300 million jobs or something like that is what, is what I heard. Is that is that the correct act, act, statistic? 300 million, three million? I don't know. Yeah, what probably. Number. Yeah, I'd say that's a low so, estimate globally. But so, yeah, some astounding you know number of jobs, 300 million jobs in the world, right? And we have a, a world of eight billion people at the time of this uh, of this podcast recording. So I, I would say, yeah, I, th I think it's going to take over. I think it's very smart for you to be also um, to have your own business, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's good to be a, a, a master of your own domain and be in a business where you can use AI to help out your clients. And that is also going to be AI proof. Um, so think about, you could, you know, ask AI, Hey, what are, what are the business ideas that I can create that where you will never be able to take over my job? Yeah. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to be a tradesperson, I think <laughs> electrician, that sort of thing. Service. You're right. You know, you're those right. are the, the, those are the things. And, and I'm also curious to know what you, I don't know how old your kids are and if you want to say, and it's okay if you don't, but 
the you know what are you saying to your kids like how you know because i i have children you know i have i have children as well and it's i'm curious to know what you say to them about you know while they're in school and they're trying to figure out where they want to go and you know it it you're you're going to have to tell them and, and try and give them some guidance. And, and how do you do that in a world where everything's moving so quickly and you're de- and we, whether we like it or not, we live in a society where people are judgmental about what types of work you do. So, you know, if you do blue collar work, then people will judge you, even though you probably make more money than they do <laughs> um, yeah. and you've got more job security, but, do you know what I mean? It's like it's a really confusing kind of time because because nothing's ever come for the smart people before. And now it's coming for the smart people who work the white collar jobs. And and I think there's going to be there's going to have to be a big distribution. And I'm just curious to what you say to your kids. Yeah, I say I say I find myself saying the stranger things, David. Oh, my gosh. I love this question, um, because, you know, for me, I'm the son of immigrant parents. And as many people know, when you have immigrants, um, they're very they put a high a value on education. So for me, yeah. you know, I, I did five year college, you know, I got a, a bachelor of science degree. And you know, I did the, the works I'm graduate, I graduated 2003. So quite some time ago, and it was a different time back then, you know, and that's what you needed to, to get a good job and for people to take you seriously and for you to get places. But now I'm like, do really, we have to really think like, do we really need to go to college to get this degree and pursue this, this degree that somebody would typically be pursuing? And is there going to, are there even going to be jobs in the marketplace once, you know, the exactly. students yeah. graduate? Yeah. So now you've paid, you know, 50,000 pounds, a hundred thousand pounds, you know, or dollars and you've gotten this degree and now you're, you just graduated and there's no jobs, Exactly. you know, and yeah. And yeah, and your industry is basically already, you know, uh, flushed down the toilet, you know, it's been re- replaced by AI. And so that's why I'm like, wow, you know, like, you exactly. really have to, yeah. to, to think about those things. So that's why I'm like, my kids are still a little bit younger than yours. So I have a 10 year old girl and a thir- uh, sorry, a 13 year old girl and a 10 year old boy. Right. So they're still in elementary school. I'm younger, going to eighth grade and going to. Well, I was going to say she's coming on the high school scene, though. So you know, and yeah. then she's going to have, you know, th- then you get that whole decision process of what's she going to do after high school, and you know, is in the U.S. and and maybe you can answer this for me um, because I don't know, and I've been gone for 25 years, so I don't really know anything about the ed- kind of how everything's playing out at the minute, and and I certainly don't know about how it's playing out in California, but. Here in the UK, they're putting a big emphasis these days on um, vocational training mm. and um, um, apprenticeships. So there's a there's a government program to really encourage apprenticeships. Now, when you say apprenticeships, it doesn't mean that you have you know it's not necessarily going to be a plumber or whatever. You could be an apprentice in digital marketing if you want to, um, but it's like on the job training, and the government will will um, support part of the the salary for that person to be in that job to get them jobs so that they get on the job training but a lot of kids now i think and certainly in my son's year and there's a lot of discussion about well do we need to actually go to university maybe we can just do an apprenticeship instead because instead of racking up debt we're actually making money and we're working in a real job and we're getting there there are classes in education that go with it at the same time so it's not like you're just doing a job you're also getting some classroom tuition as well but that seems to be a very popular thing that's starting to gain more traction here and i was curious to know did do they even because when i was in school in the us they didn't really have anything like that at all and um i, I don't know do they have anything like that now they don't. And unfortunately, the U.S. is behind, you know, most developed countries when it comes to the educational system. And that's still the case. So they have not done that. It sounds like a wonderful program that you guys have in the U.K. Very, very smart, very wise. So I would say absolutely continue to go down that, that road. Uh, but yeah, over here in the U.S., still, still, I don't know if they ever will come up with such a program or not. But I think it, it is smart to see the writing on the wall and to to basically uh, to be shrewd. You know, if you see dangers coming or, you know, you want to prepare for it. And, and that's yeah. the thing. And also both me and you, Dave, you know, we have a tech background and we've worked in the technology sector for for many decades. 
And, you know, it used to be back in the day when we were younger, earlier in our career, you know, if you wanted to be taken seriously, you want to get promoted into management, you would need to have an undergrad degree, yep. a five-year or four-year degree. Yep. It's no longer the case. You know, there's many, many smart people in, our, in the tech world that dropped out from college and, and they got promoted um, now because, you know, I have certain skills that they have or people skills that they have and, or they have whatever that is valued by their employer. So it's just it's just a different world you know like my parents would definitely never even imagine saying like don't go to college you know don't get a degree yeah. but now yeah. i'm finding myself being like oh my gosh like do we really want to pay a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand pounds for this degree you know that is basically yeah not exactly be useful no exactly but then on the other hand you have an entry-level position working at some firm and they want somebody with a master's degree and they're going to pay you 25 grand a year. It's like, it doesn't make, it's the whole thing is just ridiculous. And I've, you know, there's been a lot of chat about it over here and every once in a while, you know, somebody posts one of these ridiculous job postings on LinkedIn. And it's just like, what are these people thinking? You know, it's like, this is an entry-level position and they're asking for people with degrees. And it's like someone with a degree isn't going to want to make 20 grand a year on an entry-level in some entry level job and it's like the so if you if you even try to apply for it that you get immediately weeded out by the algorithm because the algorithm goes oh well you don't have a, a degree so we're not even going to look at your application and it's like you can't even you know you can't even get your foot in the door so something's got to change we, you know we we really have to look at it and it's not just the US it's it's everywhere around the world i think we're all everybody's suffering from the same problem and it's only going to get worse as you know, the technology improves and everything starts to move faster. So, yeah, absolutely. I think it's important yeah. to to think about, you know, uh, where, where do you really want to go? And that's why I was saying earlier today that I really like the idea of side hustles and businesses, because then, you know, you're not at the mercy of somebody saying like, OK, sorry, we're going to cut off your job. You know, we don't need you anymore. AI is replacing your job. You no longer need it or whatever. And, and that's the problem with going and having these things, you know, these these jobs where you're working for employees, white color jobs, you know, is that really like, is your job safe? I don't know. It just depends on what you're going to choose. But like you're saying earlier, a lot more people are going to need the vocational kind of jobs, you know, the plumbers, electricians and stuff like that until until one day we create a robot that can be an electrician that can get electrocuted, electrocuted yeah. all day long and he doesn't die. You know, it's amazing. I, I think we're still I think we're actually much further away from that than we are from a, an AGI solution Correct. just because Correct. there's a there's a there's some physical restrictions to it. And the, and the, I know some roboticists and they've talked about it sort of with me at length and I'm, I'm trying to get him on the show, but I haven't been able to get him to convince him to come on yet, but I will at some point. Um, will, if you're listening, I still want you on the show. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so two, two things, I'm conscious of time. We're, we're, we're about out of time here. So one thing is just before I ask you the last question and put you on the spot, um, where can people find you? And you know how do, how do they get in touch? Sure, uh, you can find uh, my company, and the best place to reach us is at swiftpresssupport.com. So that's swiftpresssupport.com, and from there you can see all of our social media handles. Although the best way to to get in touch is to you know fill out the contact form or book a call. You could book a call on um, on my website. So that's the best way to uh, to connect with me. Awesome. Last question. I am going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, Please, if you. If you could hear from someone on the podcast, who's the person on this podcast, who's the person that you would like to hear their thoughts on AI? Who would you like to hear from? Oh, uh, sure. It yeah. could be anybody. Uh, yeah. Get me, uh, what's it called? Uh, Sam uh, Altman. So <laughs> can, can you do that? <laughs> it's a shout out to Sam Altman. I will, uh, I will use it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's a deal. Yeah. I think he, he would be a good person to have on, you know, and I think with your pointed questions and, and your, your amazing questions that you've asked today, I think you'd really be able to dig deeper and get things out of Sam that other, um, you know, interviewers typically would not have asked them. So uh, I love the questions. You're very insightful, very thoughtful about Thank your you. questions. So that's why I'm, I'm like, Hey, I'd, I would like to see an interview with you and Sam as opposed to anybody else. I'm Sam's way smarter than me. So I could ask him stupid questions for an hour and see if I could trip him up. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Absolutely. Peter, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. 
Uh, thank you so much, David. Amazing conversations, amazing questions. I love everything that you said today. And I hope that I'll uh, get invited for another uh, talk with you sometime soon. Brilliant. We'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious.